All right, chapter eight is all about risk, okay? Um, risk is everywhere. I hope we all realize that. That's why we have insurance, that we have all kinds of other issues, okay? And managing it is obviously a big issue, okay? And identifying and controlling it are the two main aspects, okay? It says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. This is Sun Tzu. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you also suffer defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Wait, it makes sense? I, I'd say that makes pretty good sense. Okay? It'd be nice if we knew everything about us and the enemy, but that's not going to happen. In the IT world, could we ever know everything about the enemy? No, because there's always a new enemy out there. But kind of cool. Knowing yourself, that's what are we doing? What do we have going here? Before we can protect ourselves, we need to know ourselves. And that's uh, a lot of people mess up in that area because they don't even know what they're running. Like, I don't know if you could go to your IT services here on campus and get an accurate account of every IT asset. And nice if you could, but so many places don't. Okay. Do you guys track all the stuff like computers and all that stuff? Track them soon. Do you guys track monitors still? We stopped tracking monitors a couple years ago. Yeah, we no longer track stuff unless it's five hundred dollars or more. It was funny. I I got an iPhone that was unlocked for using my friends' class, so it cost six hundred dollars. So we're tracking it. Yet I got three iPads at four ninety nine ninety nine a piece. They're not being tracked. <laughs> so it's like you're tracking the iPhone, you're not tracking the iPads. But uh, it just seemed kind of weird to me. Okay. All right, so, so armed with knowledge about yourself, you can initiate an in-depth management program. Right? Makes sense. You need to know about yourself. It's a whole entire process. We also, that's uh, 800-30, if I remember right. I think we looked at it a little bit yesterday. Okay. Now, knowing the enemy is to figure out what the threats are. What are our threats, internal and external? Okay. And, you know, how can they affect our assets? Okay. And the risk management is controlling this. You can't control it. You've got to mitigate it. All right. Something we must do, we must evaluate the controls, figure out which controls are most cost effective. Okay. Um, you can think of that like which virus scanner is cheaper. And just because it's cheaper doesn't mean it's always better. Okay. So what do you all use at home for your virus scanner? Symantec. Symantec. Okay. Anyone else? Security, Security Essentials. Security Essentials. What do you use? Avira. Avira. I never heard of that one. Okay, I sw you know I have access to McAfee. Well, I did. Okay, our school just switched, but I still use Microsoft Security Essentials. I think it works better. Okay, Symantec. That's Norton, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, I had issues with their stuff. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was the enterprise management component of it. I didn't like. I just. It I don't. Comes with Comcast. Uh, oh, cable. Oh, uh, yeah. So you know the prices, right? Yeah, our provi my provider is Cox, and we get McAfee free from them. But I still like the Security Essentials. It seems to catch stuff no one else does. So, um, I, um, think it's, I think it's that's one of the most lightweight ones, too. Yeah, it doesn't screw you up, basically. Yeah. 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 I mean, AVG starts to fall your stuff down. Yeah. And the one thing I don't like about AVG and Avast and all them is they keep saying, hey, you're using the free version. Why don't you upgrade to the pro version and get this, 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 this? And no, not, not a fan of that. All right. So determine which are cost effective, and once you determine that, go out and acquire them and implement them. And make sure they actually happen, then identify your risks, and come up with your findings. That's really how it all works, okay? And there's what we just talked about. Okay. So it begins with the process of self-examination. Again, that's, I mentioned that many people have an issue with this because they don't know what they have. And... Excuse me, at least my organization, they rely on the automated tools. That's not always good, especially when I pointed out to them that not all systems are on their network. And what about systems that are currently checked out by faculty? You know, I have a MacBook at home. That's not in, I mean, it's inventory, but it's not ch tracked through the software, so do they even consider that? I don't know. Okay. All right, so keeping track of all this stuff, obviously important. And then prioritize based on importance. So Ken Dewey's MacBook or the PeopleSoft server that runs our student information system, which one's more important? Yeah, probably the PeopleSoft. So if we're going to spend any money, we probably want to spend it there. 
So it's kind of important to prioritize what's going on. Okay. And assets could be people, procedures, data, information, software, hard work, network. It could be anything. Okay. Anything that pertains to it. Okay. So how could people be considered an asset? Well, maybe you've been trained. We spend thousands of dollars on training, and you, you administer the XYZ product, and so, yeah, obviously you're an asset. Okay. When I worked for uh, Customs, whenever right. there was a natural disaster, the first thing you always had to do is establish, are, are your people still alive and available? Nice. That's considered the first asset to ensure. Because then after that, then you could use those people for right. other things, but that was the first asset to yeah. Do you have any people to work with? Yeah, that's kind of yeah. kind of handy. Yeah. Yeah, well, cool. All right. It says this step should be done without prejudging the value. Write down everything you have. Don't say, ah, that's cheap. I'm not going to worry about that one. You should still write down everything you have. Okay? All right. Here they talk about people inside an organization or could also be outside of an organization. If you, like, okay, Tinker, they hire out a lot of stuff to tech systems and a couple other companies. So would tech systems be considered an asset to Tinker? Yeah, because they're the contractor on them. Or how about the people that provide food services, all that stuff, you know. We've outsourced our food services at our campus, and I've never eaten there since they've done that. But uh, I'm assuming that would be considered as an asset, okay. Data, software, networking, all that stuff would be considered assets, okay. It so says inventory process requires planning. Why would that require planning? Well, a lot of people have stuff checked out, and it could take time. I don't know. I really don't know how long it would take to inventory an entire campus. It would probably take forever, it seems like. Okay? Could be automated. Could be manual. Okay? And what are you going to keep track of each of them? Uh, it was funny. They, uh, whatever new software they're using in our IT services to track hardware and software, uh, I was at a conference somewhere, and I got an, an email from the CIO saying, Ken, you have unauthorized software on your machine. i like, okay. I said, I'm not there right now. When I get back, I'll look at it. So I got back. I looked at it and says, Where's, what software is unauthorized? They said, you have Adobe Acrobat 9 dot whatever version, and you're not listed as one of the machines authorized to have it installed. I walked over to my bookshelf and said, here you go. I've got software right here. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Bought it myself. So, and like, okay. Well, what it was is they were going by their list, and they just didn't realize they had another copy of it. So, But it, it worked, worked out pretty good. Okay. So determine what we're going to keep track of at each one. Hardware-wise, that's always a good thing to look at as well because we've had a problem with theft. Processors, memory, stuff can be stolen quite easily, so it wouldn't hurt to keep track of that. Okay. Some things like names, IP address, MAC address. Um, I don't know if they do it anymore. What, what kind of systems are these? Optiplexes? The Optiplexes. Uh, when I um, started buying systems through my through Dell for my clients a few years ago. With Optiplex, they started putting nice stickers on the top that included all the components of it. See, they don't have them on yours. They don't have my work. Maybe they stopped doing it. But it had the installed memory, hardware, everything that it shipped with, which was kind of very nice. So, But it doesn't to keep track of all that. Software version, update version, but this stuff changes all the time. So, Physical location, okay, and controlling who's got it. Kind of handy. Uh, when I was a tinker in the military, before I retired there, uh, I was the ADPE custodian there for a while. The automated data processing equipment custodian keep track of all this stuff. And remember the old IBM Selectric typewriters, the one that had the round ball that would jump when you typed? Those were about $3,000 a piece when you purchased them. When I was getting ready to retire, they were doing an inventory, and they found all these typewriters are missing. So they came to us and said, whoa, you got like, you know, however X number of typewriters missing at $3,000 a piece. Someone's got to cough up some money. So we basically went to the commander and says, those typewriters were thrown in the trash. And they says, no, that, not good answer. So we basically had to get documentation stating that they no longer had value. So why track something that no longer, even though we paid $3,000 for it, today's value is zero. So they finally said okay with it and we didn't have to do anything with it, but... Could be an issue, okay? So that's why controlling entities is nice. You can see who had it last, stuff like that, okay? People procedures and data procedures can also be important. Like you were talking about someone stealing, um, you know, what people did, what didn't work, rather than, you know, stuff that did work, what didn't work. That's also, that's a, what procedure didn't work. You ever seen the movie uh, Paycheck? The guy would reverse engineer stuff. 
that was a kind of a cool movie. It was kind of, yeah, he would steal, they would take someone else's equipment, reverse engineer it, and resell it. Same kind of thing here. That would, that would be considered an asset. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ben Affleck. Ben, there you go, Ben Affleck, yeah. I, I, weird movie, but it wasn't bad. Okay. So knowledge, experience, judgment, all that stuff comes into play when doing this. Once you're identified, okay, there has to be some sort of process of keeping track of it all, okay. They talk about more stuff about people. Maybe you want to keep track of their special skills. I um, had an SEI identifier when I was in the military for AWACS, which means I was trained to work on AWACS, but it would happen to be AWACS engines because I was an engine mechanic on AWACS. Then, oh, this was mid-90s sometime. I got a notification. I had to... I was moving to Florida. You know, they, they were sending me to Florida. I said, why am I going there? Well, you're going to be the liaison between a civilian contractor and the military for AWACS radar. I said, what? They said, yes, you hold the SEI, Special Experience Identifier, for AWACS, so you can do this. I said, yeah, dude, I don't know anything with the radar. I work on engines. But it didn't matter. The skill, level, the skill set they had me listed under just said AWACS. It didn't. I never ended up going, but it was stupid. They were processing me to leave based on something I didn't even have a clue about. So, All right, security clearance is another thing that's kind of important. Keep track of that. That's a very valuable commodity. Okay. All right, and then procedures. What are they and what do they do? Documentation is always a big issue. That's one thing I cover in like all my Java classes. I make sure the students understand documentation. I want comments in your code. I want you to tell me exactly what it's doing because that's all we know. Okay. And here's some more sample of procedures, per sample of data, or sample of data. Okay, more data could be location, backup procedures. So a lot of different answers there. Okay, classifying and categorizing. We need to classify them as what they do. Sensitivity. This could be not secure. Could be secure. Could be important. Could be non-important. Okay. Then give them a level of protection needed. Do we have to secure them? Like, obviously, this desktop needs less protection than your data center, stuff like that. Okay. All right. And some is personnel. It could be alternative. Okay. So you could actually do them multiple ways as well. Okay. All right. They all should be cate categorized, classified. Which one's more valuable? We already mentioned that. Some relevant questions. Which asset is the most critical? I would say our data, at least on our organization is. Okay. Which asset generates the most revenue? I would say that would be the different programs or the curriculum. Okay. Which asset generates the highest profitability? Definitely not our bookstore, but I don't know, whatever that is. Okay. Most expensive to replace, most expensive to protect. Okay. Compromise would be the most embarrassing. So there's a lot of different questions you can ask. Okay. All right. Final step on identification is listed in order of importance. Okay. And you can do with a weighting factor here. Which one's the most important? Which one's the least important? Okay. So there's impact on revenue. So that would be the only listed. EDI document set one. Actually, it would be the EDI document set one. There it is. And two, I guess, are the same. All right. Then we need to identify our threats. What are our threats to whatever? So it could be threats to people, threats to person, threats to equipment, threats to whatever. Okay. You know, they talk about how each one's a separate challenge. It really depends on what they are. Okay. It says, each must be further examined to determine its potential to affect the target asset. Okay. So, here, active human error or failure. Yeah, that could be an issue. Is that a threat? Yeah, we all put stuff in there wrong. Um, I've even done it. You ever put grades in wrong? Oh, with Park University, I had to put grades in at the end of each semester. And they went to the new system. When, when they first started going to the web-based system, you would go to each person, you would select the grade, and they had a drop-down list. And you would scroll to whatever, A, B, C, D, e, F. Okay? Then you go to the next person. Well, just like any other normal person, I put in the grade, scroll down to the next person. The problem was when I was scrolling, it was changing the grades in the drop-down list, so everybody was getting Fs. I had submitted a whole bunch of people, got that, and I didn't even realize it until I submitted it. I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. So a bunch of people got Fs. So I had to fix all that. So they have since changed. Now we actually have to type them in. Scroll option for grades was a bad idea, very bad idea. Okay. Right, there could be a lot of other stuff out there. Equipment failure. 
Can we get rid of equipment failure? No, we can have redundancy, but will we ever totally get rid of it? Probably not. Okay. All right, there's some more software attacks. They're just listing all of them. Okay. So begin to review every information asset for each threat. So we have our assets, we have the threats, and see which one pertains to each one. Okay. It says a list of assets and vulnerabilities have been identified. Now we know what threats are against which asset. Okay. It's our starting point of the assessment. Okay. So human failure or error or failure could be employees or contractors may cause an outage if configuration errors are made. Someone could screw up. Okay. Uh, I remember one day I was actually editing my firewall remotely. Not a good idea. I was, I was doing the ACL and I actually cut myself off. And man, I knew it the moment I did it. I'm like, because normally what I would do is I would get into an internal system and then apply the changes from internally, even though it was extra. That way, even though it cut me off, still that internal system would still apply the rest of the update. Well, this time I didn't do it. I edited the firewall directly, immediately cut me right off. Oh, crap. So I knew what I did, hopped in the car, ran home, answered the 20 phone calls on the way about why the whole network's down. Like, what an idiot. Okay. Yeah, that happened to me too with a password file on the Linux system, and I was doing it remotely and locked me out, and I had to drive in, and same thing, my phone was ringing. Oh. <laughs> I remember when a I, IIS 7 first came out, whatever server that version came out in, maybe it was 6, but I was uh, messing with that Marine guy's website, and I accidentally deleted the configuration file. I mean, I had backups and everything, so that'd be it. I deleted the configuration. I mean, it was like 5 in the morning, because I did most of my work off hours, so no one noticed. I accidentally deleted it, so then all I had to do was, you know, grab the tape and restore it, but it was down for maybe 5 minutes. I'll be darned, my phone didn't ring from the owner. Ken, my website's down. I'm like, what are you doing awake? I think he would just sit there and refresh his website all day long. Oh, look, I sold another whatever. I sold another whatever. Drove me crazy. All that money, you see those yes, he was. I remember when he first started actually selling online, and he called me, Ken, I got an order. Oh, I got five orders today. Then he got the, I got a $300 order. Then I got a $1,000 order. Then it's like, how come I only got a thousand orders today? I'm like, man, I would hate to have that problem. <laughs> but, uh, nice guy. You know, he's he's Marines. If you know anything about Marines, that saying "once a Marine, always a Marine," that's true. In the Air Force, once in the Air Force, the moment you retire, you're out of the Air Force. At <laughs> least for most of us. I still like my benefits, but I'm not going to sit around there and wear my uniform and all this I other stuff. About all your exactly. <laughs> but what was funny was. Obviously, you know, we would play with each other because he was in Marines. I was Air Force. Obviously, Air Force is better. He'd say Marines are better. I used to go to his machine. I'd, get, I'd put Air Force mouse pads on his desk. i changed change the screensaver to aim high Air Force. He comes, give me this damn thing. I don't know how to get this off here. It was so funny. I used to give him a hard time. But it was, it was, it was exciting. Okay. So all this information will obviously be included in a worksheet that we end up with. And here's kind of what it could look like. We could have our assets at the top and the threats that pertain to them. Okay. All right. So what is risk? It says risk is the likelihood of the occurrence of a vulnerability multiplied by the value of the asset. So uh, if I have something that's worthless, uh, so I, I have a, a prime example. We have a couple faculty members retired this semester. They put their old books that were on their shelves out in the hallway with a note that says free for the taking. So obviously that was an asset. It was a book. But the likeliness of being stolen was pretty high, considering it has the word free to take me. But what was the value of the book? They're old. They're out there, so really the value is worthless. Right. It's like those typewriters I told you about. Yeah, they had value at one time, but when they were thrown away, they really had no more value at that point. So it needs to be updated, okay? So it says the percentage of risk mitigated by current controls. In other words, what are we doing? So we have insurance. I have homeowner's insurance. I told you I'm getting a new roof now for $20,000. So I pay $1,200 a year, so I don't have to pay $20,000 a year. So is that a good investment on my, my half? Heck, yes, it is, okay? But is it always that way? No. I'm assuming you guys probably don't get your roofs replaced quite as often. Not that often. Man, I can't believe how many roofs I I mean, why would I do it? You know? I mean, why would I not do it? I mean, they're coming out, we're going to give you a free roof. We might say, no, no, it's okay. I just, like, 
Fine. Your second car. Yeah. Yeah, one got totaled and Oh, really? Totaled? Oh, wow. Huh. I can't imagine that much hail damage. Oh, my God. We had a... We had our news channel four, one of the big stations in Oklahoma City, when we had the hailstorm just recently, like a couple weeks ago. They were, yeah, you know, I was watching the news. I very seldom watched the news. I was watching that, and they were showing the hailstorm coming. It was going right toward the news station, and you could hear it on the building of the news station. It was like someone was banging on the roof, and he's like, "Man, I've never heard of that." But then they bring one of the cameras outside the news station, and their vans, their cars, the windshields were gone. It literally smashed right through them, and they're like. Wow, was like, that's a heck of a, they said, hailstones up to grapefruits. That's, that's big hailstones. Yeah. yeah, and I guess the news guy who was doing the reporting, Rich Mitchell, he said his house, it blew out all of his back windows of his house. So it's. Wow. I can't, I didn't see that, but could you imagine <laughs> grapefruit size hail? Can you imagine running out there hitting you in the head? No, that wouldn't be good. Okay. The, uh, there was a, uh, uh, earlier this year, there was a hail storm in, uh, somewhere in Texas, and it was, it piled up four feet of hail. Oh, uh, they weren't big, yeah. they were little, but it was four feet wow. of hail. That was amazing. Then you gotta let it melt before you can go anywhere. Right. That wow. That was amazing. Huh. That's crazy. Okay, so we have the value of this asset. Now uh, we have some current controls in place, okay? So how much of that, you know, so is insurance, so I have a car now with car insurance on it. I have, so is the car insurance mitigating 100%? I'd say it is. Now, I had a friend the other day who actually his car got totaled, but he owed more than the car's worth, and he didn't buy that gap insurance, if you know what I'm talking about. And he's all upset with the insurance company. He's like, that sucks. I'm going to switch companies. They're not paying for it. I'm like, dude, you financed more than the value of the car. Why would they pay it? It's stupid. But uh, so, you know, are your controls in place? Plus the uncertainty of current knowledge of the vulnerability. Do I really know what it is? If I don't, maybe it's even going to be worse than I thought. Okay. All right. So likely it's the probability that the vulnerability would be exploited. Okay. You can get the value between 0.1 and 1. Okay. So normally high, medium, low, okay? Question to ask, what threats present a danger? What threats present the most danger to the, the information? How much would it cost to recover it? Okay, so a lot of information there. Okay, when assigning log it again, which threats would be require the greatest expenditure to prevent? So it's gonna cost me thousands of dollars to protect something that's cheap. It's a waste of time, okay? Which of the aforementioned questions is the most important? Basically, what's it going to cost to prevent it? Okay. If a bony is fully managed by an existing control, it can be set aside. So if something is 100% covered by whatever, don't worry about it. Move on to something else. If it's partially controlled, then you have to think about that as well, based on the percentage. Okay. Uncertainty. So if it's not possible to know everything about every vulnerability, but know what you can. Okay. Okay. It says... Uncertainty is an estimate made by the management using judgment and experience. I don't really know about all the viruses, but I know what has been out there. Okay. All right, and the risk determination, they talk about that here. It says asset A is a value of 50 and has one vulnerability with likelihood of 1.0 with no controls. You assume that you're 90% accurate, then B is a value of 100 and two vulnerabilities with a 0.5 controls. And three, so what, what's the results here? Okay. A ends up being 55, B ends up being 35, and B with vulnerability three ends up being 12. So you would take care of A first. Okay. Another approach, the likelihood and consequence. What's, what are the consequences of this actually happening? Okay. All right. And I guess they came from Australia. I've never seen that. The document that I never looked at that standard. I don't have it written print. I don't have it either. So, okay, it's determined based on the probability of occurrence of attack. Okay, and okay, and they're just talking about how you're gonna rank them between one to five. Cat uh, catastrophic would be five. Okay, all right. 
Let's see what else. Uh, possible controls. We could have policies. We could have programs. Technical controls. Nothing new. We've talked about all this stuff already. Okay. And there's the stuff we just talked about, but in a chart form. Okay. All right. Kind of, we already talked about that. Man, we are, this is a lot of this is repeat. Okay. okay. This is actually a short chapter. We'll get down here in a second. Okay. Um, you basically end up with a document showing your risk. There's, there's what I wanted to see. Here's our final value. So customer service request via email inbound has a risk factor of 11. Uh, and another one at 11. They repeated it. Customer service order via SSL has a risk factor of 10. So you end up with a document showing the vulnerability and the risk. Okay. So what should it look like? It lists all of it. The assets, the vulnerabilities and the ending up report showing what the result, you know, how important it is or where the odds of it happening basically, okay? And that's your rate vulnerability worksheet, okay? That's the end of this. Now, I'm gonna walk through something here. That one was shorter for once, okay?